I speak to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, here I am in the pulpit at St. George's for the first time as your co-rector, and I'm really excited to be with you. La last week, uh, during our, before our remembrance uh, service, I brought greetings, and I told you that day that those greetings would be a little bit muted because of the spirit of that day. Well, there's no longer any mute to me. <laughs> I'm delighted to be with all of you. I've been thinking about how we share our gifts for the church and the world for my first 12 days at St. George's. And I want to speak to you this morning about why I think that theme has kept coming back to me. The first is the incredible gift of the welcome that all of you have provided last Sunday morning, but also at St. George's during the week with the multitude of activities and groups that meet the leaders I've sat down with already, the gracious welcome, the hugs, the smiles in this beautiful community. No wonder I'm excited to be your co-rector. Brene Brown said this, we all have gifts and talents. When we cultivate those gifts and share them with the world, we create a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. Another reason I've been thinking about the ways that we share our gifts with the church and the world is because of how those gifts have been on full display. Last week, with our remembrance service, with the incredible and profound talent of music that resides here among us, on full display to bless the church and the world. And then yesterday, at our Christmas bazaar, I was the guy standing beside the peanuts display, in case you uh, weren't there. But to see all of the spirit of community and cooperation and friendship that blessed the church and to see all the gifts of radical hospitality, kindness, and joy that blessed the public as they came in. No wonder I've been landing on how the church is blessed by our gifts and the world as well. At the beginning of a new ministry, when a congregation is getting to know a new rector or co-rector in this case, there's often a lot of curiosity. What are they like? Will they listen to me? Will they care about the things that I care about? What are their gifts? And I know, being among you here at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock today, that there is curiosity about those things. I have curiosity as well. Do they know Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time? Do they like Top Gun as much as I do? I have my own questions about gifts and curiosity as well. So I thought this morning it may be helpful to continue that, I hope, linear theme of gifts to talk to you a little bit about how I came to be here among you. I have a long call story to ministry, which I will not share from the pulpit this morning, but I think a couple things might be of interest to you. The first is that for the longest time, I didn't think I was going to be a priest. I thought I was going to be a homicide detective. And I know you weren't expecting that. <laughs> but in carrying on the theme today of how our gifts bless the church and the world, I really discovered that those weren't my gifts. That having a bit of a, a difficult sense of direction meant it might be difficult to explain not turning in all the evidence or uh, stepping into footprints at a, at a scene. So it wasn't a good use of gifts. And then I thought I'd be a lawyer. And so I took courses and went the direction of pre-law. 
in criminology and thought that those would be a good fit for my gifts. But they weren't. Because at the heart of it all was a deep and abiding love of God and of God's people. And 20 years later, I've been incredibly blessed by serving the church. First in Nova Scotia, so for some that didn't know yet, I am a maritime. And then in Ontario, and then continuing among you today as your new co-rector, still in Ontario, but here at St. George's to answer a strong call to love God and God's people here. In carrying on the theme of gifts, I want to take a moment to speak to Martha and to say what a privilege and honor it is to join what gifts I may have with yours as the co-rector of this parish. It is a tremendous gift in my life. Martha pours herself out for her family, for her church family, and her friends. And so to join her in this pioneering ministry also speaks of a particular gift. My family, wife Krista, daughters Joy and Ivy, are a tremendous gift in my life. And I think it's important on my first Sunday in the pulpit for the congregation to know my vocation as a husband and a father is also complete. And my family have gifts of their own, tremendous gifts. Krista as a chaplain of Brock University and a board certified lactation consultant with her own clinic, which means she sees families and babies. And I'm incredibly proud of the way that she touches lives. My daughters, Joy and Ivy, with their passions and gifts, all their activities, all the ways that they bless their dad's life, and also challenge their dad and tell me how lame things are. Like, Dad, don't talk about Michael Jordan or Top Gun in your first sermon at St. George's. Oh, that's right. You told me not to do that. Yeah. The gift of my friends. For those who know me well, they know that those who walk closest to me are family to me. And I think what connects all of this together as I join all of you at St. George's is I just share my heart wherever I go. I'm a big-hearted guy, and already you're growing in my heart as your co-rector and as your priest. And that's just a little bit about me in the beginning. Now I want to talk about the gospel. And I want to continue that theme about gifts by talking about this parable today. Those parables of Jesus, those earthly stories with heavenly meaning. The gift of this story, though, we may have to dig a bit for. At first, we may not like it. The master's behavior, the language of slaves, of one being thrown into the darkness. But if we're willing to get closer to the story, we may find the gift. It comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel in a group of three stories. The parable of the bridesmaids, the story of the sheep and the goats, stories about being ready for when Jesus returns and how we are using our gifts for the world. New Testament scholars have encouraged us to look at the third servant in the story in recent years. For the third servant refuses to multiply the talents of his master. At issue is how they would have multiplied the talents. First, a little background. Talents were not coins or cash. They were hefty metals, usually gold or silver, and they weighed a lot, usually between 80 to 130 pounds. A single talent, in fact, was worth a half life's wages. So how did they accumulate that kind of wealth? By participating in a system of economic oppression, by not lifting the gifts for the world and blessing the world with those gifts by lending money to the farming poor at incredible rates of interest, 60 to 200 percent. The people often agreed out of desperation and would put their fields up as collateral 
which would almost always end in one way. Abject poverty, no fields. Two of the slaves do as they're told, and they make and multiply these talents. The third servant refuses to participate in this system. He knows this is the wrong use of gifts. He takes a stand knowing the personal cost to him. He buries the talent so it can do nothing and it does nothing. As a result, he was thrown into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. We remember Jesus before the ending of Matthew's Gospel was betrayed, arrested, and thrown into the outer darkness of suffering and crucifixion before God acted in his resurrection. The third servant was interested in a different world, a world where gifts given by God were used to bless the world and not harm the poor. One time, I saw this parable of the talents manifested in real life on full display was the start of a brand new program when I was serving my congregation in Guelph. One night, we invited an Olympic runner to come and speak to us. She came to talk to us about a program that was gaining traction in Toronto at at-risk schools and neighborhoods called Run and Read. The program was designed to send trusted adult mentors into the schools to work with the most at-risk children, children with backgrounds that would not have been unlike our story today, where systems of poverty generationally were perpetuated and families suffered. So, could we multiply the talents and find $50,000 for infrastructure, for sneakers, for snacks? The team did. Could we find the adult volunteers that would be willing to have a police background check and to go into Brant Avenue School? We did. Could we find a principal open to the sharing of the gifts of the church for the gift of the world? And we did. And so every Thursday, a team of volunteers, mostly from the church, went into Brant Avenue Public School and worked with 30 children who were often in trouble, often fighting at recess and lunch, dealing with getting expelled. We talked to the principal about a different way. And so every Thursday from 3 to 5, we would go in and train the children to run five kilometers. Halfway through the program, there was a snack. And then the second hour, the adults read to the children. And as time went by, the children read to the adults and went up in their reading levels. Also during the program, there was a values talk, something about friendship or cooperation or love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, and self-control. And what we discovered as time went by is that a new environment was sown into the school community. One day, we came in and the principal met the volunteers in the hallway, tears streaming down her face, holding up a zero. And then she went into her office to collect her thoughts. The administrator said, Tom, the zero means there were no fights at recess or lunch today. Because the kingdom of God was sown into the school. Gifts were cultivated and raised to bless the church and the world. The children saw themselves as one family and no longer fought with one another. So we gather today to reflect on gifts and how the gifts we offer bless the church and the world. 
I have seen so many of the gifts of our community on full display in just 12 days. And I'm very excited to join my gifts with Martha as your co-rector and with all of you at St. George's to grow in faith, hope, and love and to share our gifts with the church and the world around us. Amen.